standing, please, and to take your Bibles and turn with me now to Isaiah chapter 17 as we continue to make our way through the oracles of God against the nations for the next several chapters. The Lord has been and will continue to speak oracles concerning the nations and his response to them as a result of his activity in establishing and increasing his kingdom upon the earth. And so this morning we give our attention to Isaiah chapter 17 as God addresses the nation of Syria, referred to here by its capital city, Damascus. Damascus is the capital city of Syria, and so God is speaking an oracle concerning the nation of Syria. Have your Bibles, I encourage you to follow along with me or to take a pew Bible and to join with me now in, in in listening to the reading of God's word. This is what Isaiah has recorded for us, an oracle concerning Damascus. Behold, Damascus will cease to be a city and will become a heap of ruins. The cities of Aror are deserted. They will be for flocks, which will lie down and none will make them afraid. The fortress will disappear from Ephraim and the kingdoms from Damascus. And the remnant of Syria will be like the glory of the children of Israel, declares the Lord of hosts. And in that day, the glory of Jacob will be brought low, and the fat of his flesh will grow lean, and it shall be as when the reaper gathers standing grain, and his arm harvests the ears, and as when one gleans the ears of grain in the valley of Raphim. Gleanings will be left in it, as when an olive tree is beaten, Two or three berries on the top of the highest bow, four or five on the branches of a fruit tree, declares the Lord God of Israel. In that day, man will look to his maker and his eyes will look on the Holy One of Israel. He will not look to the altars, the work of his hands, and he will not look on what his own fingers have made, either the ashram or the altars of incense. In that day, their strong cities will be like the deserted places of the wooded heights and the hilltops, which they deserted because of the children of Israel, and there will be desolation. For you have forgotten the God of your salvation and have not remembered the rock of your refuge. Therefore, though you plant pleasant plants and sow the vine branch of a stranger, though you make them grow on the day that you plant them, And make them blossom in the morning that you sow, yet the harvest will flee away in a day of grief and incurable pain. Ah, the thunder of many peoples. They thunder like the thundering of the sea. Ah, the roar of nations. They roar like the roaring of mighty waters. The nations roar like the roaring of many waters, but he will rebuke them and they will flee far away. Chased like chaff on the mountains before the wind and whirling dust before the storm. At evening time, behold, terror. Before morning, they are no more. This is the portion of those who loot us and the lot of those who plunder us. Heavenly Father, as we come before you and as we come before your word as it is read and preached, continue to recognize and confess that these oracles are difficult. They're challenging to understand, and upon understanding them, they are challenging to receive. Lord, I pray that you would be gracious and kind to us, though, as we make our way through them. They are inspired. It is an inspired word, and even as Isaiah said, your word will not return to you void but it will accomplish that which it is set out to do. And so, Lord, I pray that your word would be released among your people today and that you would help us, that you would be kind and gracious to us as we hear these challenging oracles and that through your word that you might be glorified and that we might be changed, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. During what I will call uh, the season of COVID, that year and a half or so in which the world was really turned upside down and much of the world was even shut down uh, because of uh, the COVID-19 virus, 
Uh, like I'm sure many of you, I was stuck inside. Uh, I was particularly stuck inside when I had COVID for uh, those two weeks of um, quarantine and my kids even longer because they kept resetting the clock. Uh, you'll remember that the way in which you had to calculate quarantining had to do with when the last person may have had it or whatnot. And uh, gladly, I've begun to for forget some of those details. Perhaps you have too. But uh, you'll remember that uh, there was quite a, a process. My kids spent uh, well over a month in quarantine. But while we were in um, COVID and in quarantine, I took to a practice, I'm sure many of you did, which was to binge watch television. What else were you going to do? And so uh, I think Netflix stock skyrocketed as people were purchasing and buying uh, Netflix and uh, doing the online streaming uh, services and watching television. And there were two shows that I latched on to during COVID. One in particular when I was in quarantine that I binge watched with great interest and delight was the BBC's Great British Baking Show. And I was introduced to Mary Berry and all of the wonderful desserts that she made. And uh, we would watch two or three episodes a night and uh, came to quite enjoy uh, the Great British Baking Show. I think we bailed just before it started to turn into the circus, I think uh, season three or four, when it was still fairly, uh, it was still a fairly serious show about uh, baking and uh, high English culture, which we enjoyed. The other television show that I latched onto and watched almost with religious devotion was the history channel Forged in Fire, Forged in Fire, which is a competition, a, a TV show uh, that is based upon competition where four uh, people come into a forge and they have to forge out and make knives. And so you're watching these four people in this forge around the, the heat making historic uh, knives and swords. And it was, a, it was a, a tremendous show. I fell in love with everything about it. Loved everything about it. I loved how they had to select the steel. I loved watching them sweat as they were forging in the fire, as they were heating up the metal. I loved watching them swing their hammers and use what is called Big Blue, which was a power hammer that they were forging out their metal. I love the quenching in the oil, the grinding. I love the assembly of the knife, and I love the testing. And I always particularly loved when they would swing that, uh, swing that knife against something hard, and it would blow up and shatter, and you just saw their faces droop, and, and having spent hours trying to build this thing. I loved the show. It became for me a bit of a metaphor for the Christian life, forged in fire. The necessity to become strong, to take metal that was somewhat brittle and, and prone to breaking and, and having it uh, heat treated and, and having it quenched in order that it might be sharp and cut through the fog. It was a metaphor for my Christian uh, faithfulness even in the midst of, uh, of COVID, needing to cut through the fog of COVID. And so you'll imagine my interest... Uh, and my curiosity when last winter God brought to our congregation a blacksmith by the name of Steve Douglas. And just this past Thursday, I went to, along with my son Nathan, we went to Steve's forge in order to start to hammer against some steel. It wasn't just me. There were a number of others there. You see uh, Bruce Douglas, I believe, and Kirk Egland, son of... Uh, of Bob and Cindy, and I think Bob uh, or Brian Whitecaps in there, and Rick Sykes was there as well. There's been a number of folks that have been going to Steve's Forge, and I wanted to make a knife, but he said, "No, you have to start by making a fire poker." And so I spent some time making a fire poker, but I couldn't help but make it a competition because Steve told me no one had finished making a fire poker in one night, and so I said, "Absolutely, I'm doing it." And not only did I do it, but Nathan did it. And I had some of the most fun that I have had in a long time. Swinging that hammer. Getting all sweaty in my face. And I've been wondering, why did I enjoy this so much? Is it because I'm living out my fantasy that I was watching on television? 
uh, for all those, uh, for all that time during COVID. No, I enjoyed it for a couple of reasons. One is I found that Steve is actually quite a good teacher. And uh, he, he was really good at helping me to understand w- the process of how this th- thing gets done and why. And I believe that he keeps his forge open every Thursday night. So if you want to go and inundate him and learn how to make a, learn how to make a fire poker, go do it. I would, I would commend it to you. He's also quite a gifted and tal- talented craftsman. Perhaps there's something he can help you with. But I enjoyed it for a number of reasons. One is I just enjoyed spending time with my son, Nathan. Spending time with him and a little bit of friendly competition and making a memory. I enjoyed it in part because I enjoy making things. I come from a, a line of builders. My dad was a contractor. We built things growing up, and there's something about me that enjoys making and building, and this was an opportunity to make and to build. But I also enjoyed it because I think there's something just very fundamental, very basic to our humanity I had an opportunity to enter into the joy of the essence of what we are made in the image of God. We are made as human beings who have been given dominion, agency, the the commandment to subdue the world, to make something of the world, to make things in the world, and to make God's world beautiful. And so there was something about forging that metal in the fire that connected me with the very basics of my humanity and what God has called us all to be, to be his image bearers and to make things beautiful and glorious in the world. I enjoyed it because I think it got me back to first principles, something that I want to share with you today. And I don't think I'm doing violence to the text. I'm not trying to just shoehorn my experience this week into the text. I believe that when I read the text, and as I explained the text to you this morning, you'll see it too, that what God is saying to us in Isaiah chapter 17 is simply this, that God has put strength into our hands. God has put strength into the hands of men. And the question is, How will we use it? God has put strength into the hands of men and women, into mankind, into autumn kind. How will we use it? This is the pressing question of our age. This is the pressing question of our moment in history, in our moment in society. If you know anything about what's happening societally, there are young men who have been made by God to have strength in their hands and all they are doing is spending time in their basements putting into their hands video games and remote controls and chicken tenders and pornography. They're not using their strength to build And to pursue the purposes of God, it is a travesty, it is an endemic of our age. It is the question, how will we use it? It is the biblical question. All of us come to the scriptures and we hear that God has given to Adam and to Eve a dominion mandate. And we are posed with this question, how will they use the strength that is given into their hands? And what do they do? They take their hands and they reach out and they take from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and they eat of it and they use their strength for themselves. It is the biblical question asked of Adam and Eve. It is the biblical question that is asked of the patriarchs. It is the question that is asked of Jacob whose name means heel grabber. The one who was born as a twin to Esau and constantly all throughout his life, he is seeking to grab that which does not belong to him to subvert it and to make it his own. He reaches out and he wrestles with the angel of God all through the night, grabbing the heel, trying to subdue it to himself. But God changes his name from Jacob to Israel, meaning Yahweh has held you and you have survived. And he desires to bless you and to give you promises. 
It is the question that is raised of Jacob. It is the question that is raised of King Ahaz, the king who sits on the throne as Isaiah is ministering. In our text for this morning, and all the way back in Isaiah chapter 7, Ahaz means he has grasped. And Ahaz is constantly trying to grasp onto things for himself. God has put strength, agency, dominion into the hands of men. How will they use it? This is the Christian question. How is the church using its strength in the world? I shared with you at the beginning of the year as we opened up our year with that sermon series, the city of God, that holy city, and that God wanted to return strength and wealth back to the church in order that we might use it, in order that we might take it into our hands and accomplish the purposes and the plans that God has for the church. God has put strength into the hands of men and women in the church. How will we use it? God is raising this question. Because Damascus stands for something that is powerful. That humanity seeks to grab onto and to use for personal gain, personal protection, personal dominion. Damascus Syria is a hammer. It is a hammer that we and Israel seek to reach out, to grab onto, and to beat the world into submission. Damascus is a hammer that we seek to put into our hands in order that we might mold and shape the world after our likeness. Damascus is a hammer by which we make the idols that suggest to us that we're really in control, that we have power, and that we can make the world the way that we want to. Damascus stands for power, self-determining power, the will to power. It stands for that desire, that propensity to take matters into our own hands and to shape it. You've heard that for the man with a hammer, all the world is a nail. And we all have access to that hammer. And we all have deep within us that strong desire to reach out and to grab it. That's what Israel was doing. You see, Israel was a northern kingdom that was under threat from Assyria. As all of the northern kingdoms were. Jacob that heel grabber whose name was changed to Israel, that northern kingdom, that ten tribes that had walked away from Yahweh, looked at the world stage and saw that it was problematic, saw that there was this rising threat in the north. And what did Israel decide to do? Israel decided to take matters into his own hands, to stretch out his hand in league with Syria, that powerful nation in the belief that it would be a hammer in the hand that could produce for themselves protection, power, the ability to make the world the way that they wanted the world to be made. And together, the northern kingdom of Israel and Syria threatened Judah. You remember that we considered that in Isaiah chapter 7 as Ahaz is being threatened by the brothers in the north along with Syria. And rather than trusting in Yahweh, Ahaz grabs hold of an alliance with Assyria. He reaches out to the enemy. And it is his undoing. But God is bringing all of these power dynamics to nothing. He is raising them down low in order to raise up this question. What has my hand wrought? What have my hands wrought? You see, we must all give answer to that on that great and terrible day when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ. 
to give an account for our life, to give an account for the deeds while done in the body. That's what the Apostle Paul says. It's also what Isaiah says. And if you have your Bibles open, go back and look at verses 7 and 8, in which God speaks and reminds Israel that in that day man will look to his maker. Adam kind will look to his maker, and his eyes will look on the Holy One of Israel. A day is coming when we will have to look God in the face. And we will not look to the altars, the work of his hands. And he will not look at what his fingers have made, either to the ashram or to the altars of incense. There will be no power. There will be no strength. And all the things that we have fashioned for ourselves as we have taken the hammer of power into our hands to try to make the world the way that we believe it should be. What have my hands wrought? God has put strength, agency, dominion into my hands. What have I built? What did I hold on to? God says that trying to build with self-determined power, unfaithful, unsubmitted power, results in nothing but futility. Unless the Lord builds a house, the laborers labor in vain. Isaiah puts it a little differently in verses 10 and 11. For you have forgotten the God of your salvation, And have not remembered the rock of your refuge. You have forgotten the strength and the power that is found in Almighty God. You have have forgotten the strength that is in Yahweh. And you have sought out Damascus as that hammer by which you will smite the world. You have not remembered the rock of your refuge, therefore... Though you plant pleasant plants and sow the vine branch of a stranger, though you make them grow on the day that you plant them and make them blossom in the morning that you sow, yet the harvest will flee away in a day of grief and incurable pain. This is what is known as a futility curse. If you try to do things in your own strength, you will build a house and will not live in it. If you try to do things in your own strength and in your own power, you will plant a vineyard and you will not eat of it. It will not produce. Unfaithfulness, naked power leads to futility. God reminds us where the real power resides. As Isaiah speaks in verse 13, the nations roar like the roaring of many waters. You can hear the hammers beating on the steel, all those anvils going ping, 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 a cacophony of noise, a roaring of hammers beating against the steel, ping, 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 ping. But he will rebuke them with the word of his power, And they will flee away, chase like chaff on the mountains before the wind and whirling dust before the storm. We'll all come to nothing. Nevertheless, God has put strength in the hands of men. So how will we use it? How will we use the strength that God has given to us? What will we hold on to? The temptation to grasp power and to build idols that we trust in has in no way diminished in the modern era. We read of what's going on with Jacob. We read of what's going on with the nation of Israel. We read of the futility and the frustration that comes with that people trying to seek an alliance with Syria because they've been making idols for themselves And it will all come to nothing. And we think, well, thank God we're beyond the barbarism of that day. Thank God none of that happens today. Do not be fooled. We all still grab the hammers. We all swing them down. We're all trying to build a world. How will we use it? 
How will we use our agency? How will we use our humanity? What will we build? Well, that all depends on what we believe in. Where do we believe that the locus of power resides in the modern world? Does it reside in me? I remember joking around at the forge on Thursday night about the power hammer. I don't know if I said this to Nathan or Rick Sykes or somebody. We were waiting in line for the power hammer. I said, you don't need that power hammer. You got one right here. Does the power reside in me? Is it in my strength, my knowledge, my willingness to work harder than anybody else I've ever met? Is it reside in my skill? If not in me, does it reside in the other power structures in this world, in markets, in governments, in technology, in currency? Or is it possible that the locus of power in the world resides in a manger. That sign of weakness. That small little hand that actually crafted the stars and hung them in the sky. That hand that John the Revelator describes as the one who holds the stars in his hands. Does the power, the real power of the world, is it located on the cross where hands were pierced, where blood did flow? Is the real locus and power of the world located in heaven where Christ ascended and is seated at the right hand of God the Father of mighty, where his wounded and scarred hands are folded together as he ever intercedes for us. Is that what we believe in? Because what we believe in will determine very much what we build. Does divine power run through our hearts by faith in our families, in our church, in this congregation, what will we build, what will we put our hands to? What can this congregation build by faith? God has made me a builder. He's called me to set my hand to work. I used to resent the thought of being a builder. I remember after I graduated from college, wanted to go to seminary, but the way was not quite open, and so I went back to construction. I remember building these frames. I was framing out for uh, pouring some concrete. I was taking four by eight sheets of OSB, and I was framing together to make molds. For we were going uh, we to pour a concrete foundation. And I remember being by myself and ripping the wood and swinging the hammer and just being so frustrated because all I wanted to do was to go to seminary and, and I wanted to pursue the pastoral call that I knew that God had put in my heart. I used to resent being a builder only to find that when I came into pastoral ministry, I've been called to be a builder. God has made me a builder of men and I rejoice in it. He's put strength in my hand to build, to gather together, and to make, to build young men to be men, and to build young women to be women. God has called me to build a church, to build his church. What is it that we can build together by faith? What is it that God can call us together and gather us together whereby we can build? The first thing that he wants us to build is a local congregation. God has called us to build a local congregation that is large. Not made large because of our increasing and surpassing and beautiful facilities. Not made large because of our increasing and surpassing membership numbers. But made large by the power and the presence and the dominion and the influence of Almighty God that desires and has designed to rest and abide with the weak and seemingly insignificant things of the world. To believe that God can rest in this little congregation 
and have tremendous and disproportionate impact in our world. God has called us to build a local congregation large enough to become the center of our lives, the very heart of our lives. What is the center of the universe? It is the church. It is our church. It is this place that God has called us to. God has called the congregation, this congregation to be large, large enough and central enough to have a positive impact in our community. You see, you know, when members of the school board start getting arrested and charged with unlawful sexual activity with a minor, then you know that your community is in need of the church. And that's exactly what has happened in this place. That is exactly what has happened in our community. And what is the remedy? It's not elections. It's not candidates. It's not a better school board. It's the church. Made large by grace by power as we gather together in worship of Almighty God, believing that God has ordained to use the weak and seemingly insignificant things of this uh, uh, that he has ordered us to, to have a disproportionate power and effect in the world. God has called us to build a local congregation equipped to meet the challenges of this generation, building to be a church of worship, in order to fortify future generations. And that's why I believe that God wants us to build an educational academy for our kids, a formational community, not just a school, not just a parochial school, but a formational ministry through partnerships between parents and this church, a formational ministry that is committed to making Christians seven days a week. 12 months out of the year, 365 days out of the year, whereby we gather and we keep faith with our baptismal vows, shaping and forming the next generation for Christ, a formational ministry that teaches us how to be members of one another and how to submit to the authority of Christ Jesus. God wants us to build a local congregation, a formational ministry. And I believe God wants us to build distributions networks. What do I mean by that? I mean something like a publishing ministry whereby we leverage more and more the content that is being developed in this place. Seeing the tremendous impact of our podcast, of our scattered seeds, Um, newsletter of observations and the like and leveraging that more and more. I can foresee a ministry called Scattered Seeds Plus just like Disney Plus. But for this church local in its scope and intent but having a national denominational even a global impact as we are faithful and obedient to the things that God has called us to build in this place, not by grabbing the hammers that seem so much available, not by using the technology and the methods and the, and the ideologies and the practices of this world, but taking the things that God has put into our hands that look to us as seemingly weak and insignificant, but that God has promised to use powerfully and to shape the world means having faith in the things that are little and local and trusting that God will use it. God has put strength into our hands. Will we grab that vision? Will we grab his salvation by faith and set our hands to do his work in this generation? I want to share with you that none of this matters. None of it. The local congregation, a formational community, distribution networks, all that God might call us to build, none of it will matter if we fail to build on the foundation that God has laid. 
And what is that foundation made of? Faith. Faith and obedience. To build with faith. To build with obedience so that on that great and terrible day, all of us who will have to look to our maker, the Holy One of Israel, and he will say to us, I have put strength into your hands. What did you hold on to? What did you build? I want to say, and I believe we as a congregation want to say, we have held fast to your word. We have held fast to your king. We have held fast to the vision of the increase of your kingdom in this place. And we have been faithful. So let us build. And let us pray. Lord Jesus Christ, we want to build in accord with your great design. And we want to build in accord with the power that you've given to us. Not with the hammers of this world. That smite the earth and ring out in a cacophony of noise. Rather, we want to hear the beautiful symphony is found as your laborers work in union with the power of the Holy Spirit to make beautiful the city of God, to see your kingdom established and advanced in and through your church. Lord, we pray for our community. We pray for Mount Lebanon. We pray for the South Hills of Pittsburgh. We pray for this place that we find ourselves established in and salted into, that is lost, that is broken, and that is in need of the church and of saints who believe the gospel and are faithful with it. Help us to be that church, Lord. For your renown, for your praise, for your glory, and for the healing of the world. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.